welcome back if you are joining from last week's certificate level exams but if you're new here then hello and welcome to this video on the professional level ACA exams breakdown Now that you've entered the professional level, multiple choice exams are honestly a thing of the past. These exams, I cannot even stress enough how much of a huge step up they are from those certificate level exams. To really make sure that you do well in these exams, it is important that you have grasped that understanding from the certificate level and can bring that with you into professional level. So much of the content will be recapped anyway in these exams, so don't worry too much. But as mentioned in part one, all of the ACA professional level exams will include at least 5% of ethics and that will stem from certificate level assurance as well as that ethics learning programme. So if you were hoping that this video was going to talk you through the difficulty of the exams and kind of rank them, then unfortunately you are on the wrong video. This is a video that you should be looking for. But yeah, today's video is all around the ACA professional level exams and I'll talk you through in the order that I sat them. So my first three professional level exams, so note that I did sit three at a time and if you're interested in the intensity of sitting three professional level exams at a time then there is a link in the description below to a blog that discusses just that so my first three were in march 2019 yeah it's actually been quite a while now and then my second three were in september 2019 so i literally did sit all the first 12 aca exams within one year of starting my graduate scheme which is pretty mad that like, that is quite intense Overall though, I did actually find it fairly manageable and that intensity blog really does just break down how I kind of studied and planned for it all. It will also help you if you're questioning what order you should sit the ACA exams in and there is actually another blog on that as well. So again, link in the description below and I'm sure I'll turn these into videos soon. So make sure you do subscribe because yeah, there's honestly so much more on the way. I have already touched on access arrangements and any credit for prior learning such as exemptions and the number of attempts that you're allowed all in part one. Just have a click back to there if that's something that you want to know. I think the extra details I can give you for the professional level exams, there are actually exam sitting windows. So you can't just sit these exams at any time of the year. So it can either be March, June, September or December. In terms of how many at a time, whether you do three at a time or one each time or however it works, that usually is kind of up to you and your employer, but usually it is more of the employer's choice. So to mention, I will come on to the business planning exams and I did business planning taxation, whereas there are also options such as business planning insurance and business planning banking. And so obviously I can't speak too much about those because I really honestly don't know anything about those, but I do know that they can't be sat during the March sitting. And that's probably because they have less students sitting those exams. Right, so let's get to the good stuff and get straight into these exams. So to mention, it is 55% to pass, so that's the same for certificate, and now it's also the same for these professional level exams. So again, you may be thinking 55%, that's really low, surely the pass rates are really high. So questions like that, anything you wanna know, definitely check out the difficulty video, because I do mention pass rates in there too. So exam one of professional level that I sat was financial accounting and reporting, so FAR. This is the longest exam of all of the professional level exams and it's a three hour exam. So all of the others are two and a half hours and this one is three hours. Yes, you're hearing me correctly, three hours, honestly. When I first heard that, I was like, what on earth? But it should definitely make more sense once you come to study for this exam. And the maddest thing is, it does actually kind of feel quite time pressured in the exam. So yeah, you can only imagine kind of how much is in this exam. So definitely having a good understanding of certificate level accounting will help you for financial accounting and reporting. And if you do really want to brush up on the basic, basic accounting, then you can check out my book as well. So you can read that for free. There's a link below. So a key thing to note with financial accounting and reporting is that there's actually two variations to this exam. So there's the IFRS and there's the UK GAAP. So that's the International Financial Reporting Standard. The UK generally accepted accounting principles. So this probably means nothing to you right now and don't worry too much because your employer will usually choose which one you do based on your clients. But for me, mine was IFRS, so that's the one that I sat. And to be honest, there aren't too many differences when it comes to this exam. That IFRS, for example, would state revenue, UK GAP would perhaps state turnover. But there are also some bigger kind of financial statement presentational differences. But overall, the exams do achieve the same result. But it's worth noting then as well that these exams, regardless of the type, whether you do IFRS or UK GAP, you still are only allowed four attempts as per ICAUW. So, for example, I mean, imagine the worst case scenario, and God forbid this happens, but 
if for example you fail all of those attempts for IFRS you cannot then switch to UK GAP and you also can't sit another version after already doing one I mean I don't know why you would want to do that but <laughs> just throwing it out there. So the first question in this exam is where the student must be able to demonstrate that they can prepare single entity financial statements and that is based on scenarios given. This exam also then has a part where it actually requires a fair bit of explanation of accounting treatments. So this is where you dig into the standards and actually show that you have a good understanding of those and it's nothing to worry about too much because you are actually allowed permitted text. So that's these accounting standard books that they allow you to actually take in with you. So it is kind of open book but it is permitted text only so literally those books that they give you and honestly I personally think that those books really did help me with those explaining questions so yeah definitely as mentioned make sure you take in those permitted texts and then the final question involves preparing consolidated accounts and again this is based on a scenario and marks can vary as well from section to section and one tip that I'll give you as a spoiler to how to pass FAR is a consolidation a day keeps the reset away. So the second professional level exam is audit and assurance. So if you have a job in audit, of course, this would be a lot easier. So although I do work in external audit, and if you want to know more about that, then check out this video. As mentioned, I sat my exams really quickly, so I didn't actually really get that much audit experience before sitting the first nine exams. And one of them, of course, included audit and assurance. So this meant that I had little experience. So I kind of sat this exam, although I worked in audit, I felt like I was pretty new to it. Yeah, as now with the remaining professional level exams, this is a 2.5 hour exam. And this is another exam that has permitted text allowed. So this one is this huge, enormous book, but now of course everything's in the digital bookshelf. So you of course don't really need to carry this huge brick around. The first 20 marks are made up of a variety of audit and assurance topics. And these are short questions. So what it means by short is that you can actually answer in bullet points. So an example of a shorter question would be, oh, what audit opinion would you give in this scenario? So to be honest, these shorter questions really do just massively vary and they're hard to predict, of course. But then there's longer type questions as well that come into play. And these are around planning and performing engagements, concluding and reporting engagements and legal professional and ethical issues can be mixed into these. So again, marks vary exam to exam or question to question. And something that I will mention for audit and assurance is that from 2021, they did introduce data analytics to this exam. So there is some data analytics software that it is actually good that you practice beforehand. So there is a link in the description below if you need that. So then the third professional level exam that I sat was tax compliance. So this exam really did just feel like an extension of that certificate level principles of tax. A lot of those same computations such as income tax, national insurance contributions, etc. That is all still needed in this exam, but of course it's no longer multiple choice and you actually need to show your calculations as well. So the examiner in this exam really wants to see how you calculate these taxes based on certain scenarios. And I guess the good thing about this is that you can also then pick up method marks. So this exam always follows the same structure. It's five questions and one is ethics, which I'm sure you're glad to hear. And then there's also indirect taxes, such as VAT. There's capital taxes. And so now actually you'll learn about inheritance tax. Then there's corporation tax. And the final one is income tax combined with national insurance contributions. Spoiler alert, this is the one that I found to be the hardest professional level exam. And I know a lot of people will be surprised with that and they'll probably think that it's business planning taxation. And don't worry, I will come on to that one. But I just really found that there was just so much to remember for this exam. I was honestly so convinced that I filed this one. But again, this one also does have a permitted text allowed. So it's these Hardman's tax rate tables. But even though you do have that, it still takes a lot of practice for it all to sink in and you to actually apply it to the scenarios that you're given. But yeah, even though I say that it was the hardest one, I did kind of like doing those computations. I mean, I love math, so what can I say? So now the next exam is financial management, so FM. And this kind of does carry on from certificate level management information. What is actually good about this exam is that I found that it's always kind of structured in a similar way. I actually found it to be quite a repetitive exam, but I feel like others have said that it's not, so don't quote me on that but there were also a lot of kind of wordy answers such as the advantages of this disadvantages of this and kind of explaining that 
and that's what shouldn't be underestimated in the exam. So the first 35 mark question will usually be on investment decisions and valuations. So this is essentially calculating the net present value of an investment and working out whether it would be profitable for the shareholders. And it also might actually involve making replacement decisions on assets. And there are discount tables that can be provided in this exam that will also kind of help you with those. Yeah, it's actually quite an interesting and useful exam to be honest. Then the next 35 marks is on financing options. And a big, big, big part of this is calculating the weighted average cost of capital, which is the WAC. It also could be assessing whether debentures or a rights issue is a better option for the company based on their gearing. And the final 30 marks is around managing financial risk. So this involves like calculating foreign exchange receipts or payments based on kind of hedging techniques. So an example of this is hedging using a forward contract. And this also covers interest rate hedging and swap. So now the next exam, so exam 11, or should I say five of the six professional level exams is business strategy and technology, so BST. So this exam, the technical knowledge and everything that you need for it literally does just pretty much carry on from that certificate level business technology and finance exam. So all the models, everything that was learned in that exam is relevant to this one. So marks do vary in this exam. And although it is a pretty wordy exam, there are still some calculation marks available as well. But with that being said, I personally found this to be the easiest professional level exam. So typically there'll be a strategic analysis question and that tends to include some performance analysis. And in a way, this is kind of a taster for that exam 15, so that final case study exam. Then the other two exam questions are on strategic choice and implementation of strategy. And honestly, this exam is very, very scenario based. So it is kind of hard to say what exactly will come up, but those are kind of the broad topics. So now let's skip to the final professional level exam that I sat, which is business planning and taxation. So like I said, I didn't do the insurance or banking paper, so I can't comment on those. And this again is something that would depend on your employer in terms of what you would sit. So for example, if you work in financial services audit, then perhaps the business planning banking paper is more relevant to you. As I've mentioned, I didn't find this to be the hardest, but many other students do. But whereas in TC, you're doing a lot of the computations, I found that in business planning taxation, it's kind of less of the computations, but more of the tax advising. And in order to do that, there's honestly just so much more content that comes into it. But I'm sure you'll be glad to hear that this exam is the only professional level exam that is completely open book. So it's not permitted text, it's anything that you want. That being said though, that does just go to show that you could literally take anything in but it's all about the application for this exam. So the structure of this exam is quite consistent in terms of syllabus areas. So you'll have taxation of corporate entities, owner managed businesses, and then also personal taxation. But then saying that there's honestly so many different combinations of the different tax laws that they could bring into it, that every kind of scenario does just seem to be very varied. So you will honestly really need a good open book file for this exam. And that is something that I can help you with. So make sure you do subscribe because I will definitely be back to tell you more about that. And then as mentioned with financial accounting and reporting, where it had IFRS and UK gap, this one has those variations, but any of those counts as an attempt towards a business planning exam. What that also means is you can't just sit one variation past that and then for some reason want to try another one and do that as well. Thank you for watching. I hope you found this video insightful. And if you did, then please give me a like. But if you do have any questions or if there's anything else you want to know, then definitely drop a comment below and I'd be happy to address those. So next week will be that advanced level breakdown. So make sure you do subscribe so you don't miss this. And thank you for watching and hopefully I'll see you soon.